So I think the best start would be if you, um, if you both introduce yourselves. Yeah, morning everybody. Um, my name is John Langford. I'm the director of live entertainment at the Hydro. Um, I, I guess that's a fancy way to say I do the sex, drugs and rock and roll part of what happens in the Hydro. Um, so I'm responsible really for all the bookings um, and really all the content that goes into the Hydro and all the revenue streams outside of that. Uh, and I've been at the Hydro for just over a year now. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Tom Doyle. Um, I'm project director for the Hydro. And what that means is uh, I, I took the job from uh, sort of design and very early construction stage into operation. So we opened the back end of September last year. Um, and what I'm doing now is fixing all the bits that aren't perfect and working hard on making sure that we get better and better and better with every show that we do. So that part of Glasgow, I, I looked at photos from the early 80s and there were still docks around there. I mean, parts of it were actually keys and water. And uh, there was one film I saw, a kind of science fiction film with Harvey Keitel, where they're running around that whole area. You, you, there were sheds, there were all sorts of things that totally transformed over the, um, the past 30 years. And obviously the SECC opened in the, the mid 80s, but really could you talk us through the, the process of uh, the, the hydro, how that came into being and whose idea it was? Um, okay, well it comes from a few different places really. Um, I'm sure lots of you, certainly those of you, um, you know, uh, from the west of Scotland, will know Exhibition Centre well. And as you say, Olaf, that's, um, that's a business that started um, on the site of the former Queen's Dock. So, a, you know, a, a real centre within Glasgow for, uh, for heavy industry, for shipbuilding. Um, and you'll, the Clydeport crane's still there today, you know, the, the crane that loaded uh, trains onto, onto the boats. Um, so that sort of history, that legacy, um, is still very much with the site. And even when you visit um, the hydro, you'll still see remnants of its uh, industrial past. Um, um, and that, so it's quite powerful. There's still a very strong atmosphere um, when you visit the campus. What we did have, um, you know, uh, certainly three years ago when I joined the business, we, was, we had the main hydro, um, sorry, the main exhibition centre conference halls um, and exhibition halls um, complemented by the Armadillo, which was a, a Norman Foster building um, uh, delivered in 1997. So there were things, there were three different things that happened at Exhibition Centre in Glasgow. There was uh, conferences, there was exhibitions, and then con and concerts and events. And what was, uh, you asked about why the Hydro exists. So one of the reasons is that we had these three different businesses, these three different revenue streams, but only really one set of buildings uh, in which to put them. So we had a month um, a few years ago where we had to turn down Gaga and um, like, I'm gonna say Robbie Williams, I forget who, uh, who else was, uh, the, the, who the other act was because we had the wedding show in one of the, one of the halls. So it, it's got, in one sense, that's a great problem to have, you know, in that you're full. But there was obviously a demand for um, for an increased tenancy, for, so for more buildings on site. Um, the other two strands really were um, the uh, you know technology, audience tastes, the kind of content we were getting through um, through the site. That was all changing, um, and at a rate of knots. And the existing facilities, whilst They've done a done a great job. Um, there were things that we felt could be done even better. You know, some of that's around, um, you know, just getting a getting a pint, getting the simple things, getting a pint, getting to the loo, um, getting your t-shirt. Um, but then you've got sight lines, acoustics, just comfortable seats, all of those things. So, so that was a, and then the last but the last part of that was. Um, creating a place where it's going to sound a bit cheesy, this, but hopefully. It's happening already. You know, we had uh, Tim Blake in for a couple of nights last week. John and I were talking on the way over. And this is going to sound really cheesy, but I'm sure you'll all know it from one venue or another. It's creating a place where people have actually got a connection with the venue itself. You know, so 
I mean, Glasgow's already got that in the form of venues like the Barrowlands, um, you know, King Tut's, uh, that have got a bit of history and got some legends, um, you know, some myths that have grown up with, um, around the venue and, and the bands that have passed through. And that's what we want the Hydro, somewhere where there's some memories made. So hopefully at, at Timberlake, at Friday, Saturday night, you know, that's sort of the best part of 20,000 people who've, I think, have had a great show and a bespoke beautiful sophisticated you, building have... so that that's the why you know that's another part of the why is actually giving some giving something special to the customers well i mean to summarize really then what you what they realized was that there was a need for a, a music venue if we wanted to get big acts into scotland that it was um it was necessary to have something and it was um necessary to have something that was suitable for for big music productions and i think this is a an interesting point because it, as far as i understand it, it is uh, actually built for music in mind rather than sports is could you talk a little bit about that Th that's right so just to build on the the last point you know we realized that we could uh, there was space and ambition and demand for something and then the question after that follows after that is like a lot of other arenas around Britain and around the world, is are you going to have an anchor sports tenant? And at that point, and it, it predates John and I, but the team at, at Exhibition Centre looked around, looked at the market, looked to the west of Scotland, and all the indicators, when you look at the market, we know, we know that people in Scotland love the live entertainment. It's especially true when you look at the metrics of the west of Scotland and Glasgow. People... Uh, attend concerts more regularly in that part of the world than any other UK region. The, the, the spend per head as well, um, you know, was higher. And that's all about live music. That kept coming back. And there wasn't the same strength of demand for sports. And you think about Glasgow, so those of you who know Glasgow will, obviously the football's well known, but there's also, um, you know, Brayhead, who, and they do a great job with the ice hockey there. Um, so putting an anchor sports tenant in, there were two things with that. One, the demand didn't really satisfy it. Two, it maybe started to compromise and conflict with some of the great things, we, 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 ideas we had about providing a bespoke entertainment space. And three, the trends in terms of live versus recorded music, which I'm, I know you'll all be familiar with, they all suggested that music was the place to go. So what you, the hydro, and you'll see the snaps of it, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a slanted sort of bowl shape. It's an oval shape, a bit like a big, uh, some, somewhere in between a Colosseum and a, and an Albert Hall, if you're being all grandiose and architect about it. But that's, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that very conventional arena shape that you'll see a lot in North America, where the shape of the arena is a sports bowl and all the complications that that brings when you try and put live music or live entertainment in a sports ball so when was the when did it was it conceived i mean you you joined in 2011 so how long had there been the hydro and the planning by this stage i, I think it was when justin and Brittany were still together actually it was uh it was a while ago um it was, was that like, when you were adjusted yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i've still got those combats oh, like, don't don't make me break those out um so yeah, it was over 10 years in the gestation and these things, you'll see it, you'll see it with other cities in the UK as well, you know, who are looking at, I know there are a few other cities that are thinking about building arenas. These things are, cost so much money and have such a big economic impact on, on, the, on the cities that they're built in that they don't happen quickly, they don't happen overnight. And the, one of the other complications was that we'd gone for a bespoke design. So we got Sir Norman Foster, Foster and Partners, these world-class architects. You know, I'm thinking the Gherkin, the Reichstag in Berlin, uh, you know, all these fantastic buildings that they've got this long history of success with. But that's not quick and it's not cheap either because uh, they start from a blank piece of paper. So they sat with our operations team. And I'll, like, I'll move into the design now. They sat with our operations team and, and a piece of blank paper, really. So whereas other designers might bring you um, a tweak on, a, on an arena or a stadium that they'd successfully done elsewhere. The Foster and Partners guys, they're good listeners. And um, 
our operations team, a lot of those guys have got north of 25 years. So this is not a, this is not a quick thing. This is a this is what you're looking at is the result of north of 25 years of experience, um, and the, our guys know. Um, live entertainment and operations inside out. So that's, it's not me. I just pushed the architects in the right direction. Um, so what we did was, yes, it's good looking, but also we deliberately future-proofed it because you think about the productions and the way things are moving. You know, each year there are bigger and bigger productions with more and more trucks, more and more weight to hang from the rigs. So our rig is, you know, uh, capable of taking the biggest and beefiest, you know, productions around the Gargas of the world, the Timberlakes, the Beyonces, the doors inside in, inside the arena. We built big vehicle entry doors, and I picked that up from other venues I've worked on, so that the trucks can just can, you know, they might be in Paris the night before, Birmingham the, the day afterwards. It's really important that they are just able to load in and out with the minimum of fuss. So well, that's so they can actually intention. drive right into the venue. That's it. They can they can drive right in, and we've even built curved tunnels so 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 that they don't have to start doing three point turns in these huge huge trucks. So and we're seeing some. You know, we've not got everything right, and we're working hard to make it better each day. But um, there are some things like that that have really paid off. And it's meant that, you know, we've had Beyonce through, we've had Timberlake through, we've got some other big things, you know, that committed and that we're looking at. And those are shows that we might not have got in Hall 4. I think the other thing is, is the, I mean, what, how many is it now? It's, you must be getting close to 700,000 in the first six months. Yeah, so people. we've been open for six months. Um, we've done 61 shows and done 600,000 feed through the building. So we are effectively within the top three busiest arenas in the world. Wow, and that's just from, you know, starting off in, um, in late September. Um, this is something that I want to come back to at the time because by the, the description of it and just calculating it in my head, it seems that um, three quarters of the, from beginning to actually opening, three quarters of the time seems to have been about um, planning and um, one quarter is actually building the place and opening it. What is involved in that three quarters, um, in the, the first three quarters of the, the process? It's getting the money together. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, obviously I spoke a little bit about design, but it's putting the funding together. So, you know, um, some of which we funded, uh, some of which, uh, you know, external um, uh, funding agencies helped us with. So Scottish Enterprise uh, were a big part of that. Um, and quite rightly, they need to see that you've got the right people in place, um, the right calibre, right expertise. Um, that you've got a robust business plan in place as well. And they'll only release money, you know, in stages and only once those hurdles are passed. And then there's all the other hurdles that you might expect. And that's ab about, you know, build, um, behaving responsibly, you know, because this has got such a big impact on, on Finiston and on the city of Glasgow that, as you can imagine, there are all the all those kind of planning and stakeholder considerations. So we've had to do this thing, you know, um, in lockstep with lots and lots of different groups and take them, take them with us. Are there any particularly unusual things that have to be considered that probably wouldn't spring to mind you know, that goes beyond planning or building? Yeah, it's, this is, um, yeah. So one, one uh, aspect is that Venues this scale and this size, um, and in the, uh, the entertainment or the sports business, one one side of this thing now of being in this business is that you need com you know commercial income, and uh, the commercial side of it is a is a, a huge part of this. So we we the SSE Hydro, and we've had to uh, you know seek um, commercial partners to to uh, to. to uh, uh, and that's been a big part of making the venue happen. So they're what helps our, they're one of our revenue streams in the same way that food and beverage, that, you know, ticketing, um, um, all of those good things, all of those very conventional revenue streams. There's, an, there's this other sort of strand in the form of commercial revenue. 
And in order for a big established company like SSE to put their name to the building, we have to make sure that um, there are lots of places for them to, uh, in which their brand can show up appropriately. And we have to give them a building that's fit for their purpose as well as the ticket going public or, and as well as the promoters. And that's a little sophistication, that's a little slant, which um, you know is a little bit unusual. Um, so what we did in the hydro is there's quite a lot of technology in there. That facade that you're looking at there, that's made of a, a special um, fabric initially developed for the, it's part of the space race, and it's called ETFE. And that Allianz Stadium in Munich, um, by a couple of architects called Herzog and Demuron, that's a, that's the same fabric. Um, mm. So that whole that whole I don't know how many of you've been or driven past, but that whole outer facade of the building can be turned uh, 12.8 million different colorways. Um, there's 137 uh, plasma screens throughout the building, and that's all in service of providing information, messages uh, to the ticket going, you know, to ticket holders, and providing a space for our commercial partners. And that, if you took if you took those things out of the building, you'd have a building that was less an animated, less interesting, less flexible. Um, and uh, but you'd also you wouldn't have the commercial income that helps our business keep rolling. So you're you're coming as a as a project manager, and did you? you know, you're going into meetings, uh, is at this stage you go to a meeting and someone says, right, we want to put these things on the outside that were used when they were sending someone to the moon, or <laughs> how, does it, how does it work? At which point do, does someone go, right, we're going to put these panels on the front and you can have t over 12 million different colours? Yeah, so some of that is the fact you've got these really sparky, world class is not hyping this the architects and they're going to go off and bring you crazy ideas you know um from other successful places around the world or just and and really push really push you as a client and as an venue um but the other the other part of this is that we spent a long time and it was it was the guys before me rather than me personally but we did a lot of visiting and other venues, talking with promoters, talking with the, you know, so it's promoters, it's agents, it's, it's, our, it's our friends and colleagues across the industry in arenas um, and, and, and smaller venues, just seeing what works and, and what worked well, what didn't work well, what the trends were. Um, you know, so we've got boxes at the Hydra, we've got 11 boxes. There, there are lots of different things you can do to provide that sort of VIP box experience. And um, rather than reinvent the wheel there, we just looked at other venues and cherry-picked the successful elements of those. And that's one aspect that's working out well for us. So you came in from a sports background and you're or designing and um, working on sports buildings. Um, is that correct? That, that's right. So I, I came to Glasgow in 2011 and I was lucky. I'd had um, four years on the Olympic program under a couple of years working as part of the team on the stadium. So I came up and my client on the stadium had, had kindly recommended me for the job in Glasgow. Um, and I came up all cocky thinking I knew what a venue was and because of the, all the interest, all the scrutiny um, around, around the, the Olympics and the Olympic Stadium. And we'd had interfaces like the commercial partners and the TV. I mean, the TV audience for, for the Olympics was, was crackers. A million people used that one building in, in two weeks. But I soon learned, um, you know, I'm no um, entertainment veteran, you know, and I'm still learning. And there's a really steep learning curve coming into it. And uh, certainly the promoters are not shy about helping you up the learning curve. And I'm sure uh, lots of you will know that. And um, so what was, you know, what was the biggest thing that you had to get your head around coming from a, a sports background? Um, I th well, I think th there's things like a a acoustics, um, uh, making sure, for instance, that the bowl was as dark as possible. And that, that drill, you have to drill right down into the minute detail for that. So that might be the fact that you've got, the, uh, in the boxes, for instance, the little fridges, and you open the fridge, and there's a light in the fridge. But those fridges are at eye level with the artist. So what we've done is have to make sure that we take all the bulbs out of the fridges, and uh, the guys opening the fridges have got really good eyesight, because that all starts to impact on 
uh, on the artist experience. Um, and you know we can't have that because by extension that's going to impact on, you know, on uh, the, the fan experience. So it's just it, it, it's really and again this might sound cheesy, Olaf, but it's looking at that customer journey um, right from the point at which they're considering the, t the uh, you know which gigs to go to, um, all the you know right through that journey to the gig, to the venue itself, all the physical stuff. Um, the experience on the night and and like and staying in contact with them um, after they've after they've enjoyed the show and some of that's physical and hopefully we and myself and the design team did what we could with the with the building itself but John John might give you a few pointers as to um, you know how on the experience side we're working hard to build meaningful relationships with the fans. So just before I move on to John, is it you that's managed to get? Wi-Fi to work for 13,000 people. We've got lots of Wi-Fi. Can you, can you, can you maybe like go out and do some tours on ScotRail and um, East Coast and various other places, the airport bus, and explain to them how you do it for 13,000 people and maybe they can do it on a train or yeah. some other area. How do you manage to get it? How do you manage to get it to work? So it's an expectation, quite rightly, um, that venues will have Wi-Fi now. It's free uh, to our customers. It's a chance to connect with them as well. Um, but it was tough because we'd started building it without those plans in place. So there's some complications because you're racing ahead and building the thing, but you also know that by the time you open, you've got to find a, a, a way technically of providing that Wi-Fi. But we're really lucky. There was a company called Zurus, and they've got a new way of doing Wi-Fi. It's completely different to anything that you'd, you'd know from, you know, say to what I've got in my flat. Um, it's just a completely different way of punting that signal out to people. And it's all scalable. So, you know, if there are certain constant, if, if the, the number of people who want to use Wi-Fi is concentrated on a certain part of the arena floor or a certain part of the building, then the idea at least is that we can scale up and down and segment um, different user groups. So that's really useful, say, for the promoters and for the production. They've got their own discrete Wi-Fi network. So when they, you know, they roll in early on in the day and they'll need, to, they'll act quite rightly expect to be working off of a Wi-Fi network. In, o in other venues, um, what they find is that when the general public roll up, that their Wi-Fi suddenly dives off a cliff because 10,000 people are logging on. And the idea with what we've built is that because we've got more, uh, more uh, control over the system, that that doesn't happen and that everyone gets the right experience. So what are they called again? Cirrus? Cirrus, yeah. Right. Respect to Cirrus. <laughs> they managed to sort something that I no one else has managed now. to sort. Yeah. Um, now, John, you came from South Africa, and it, it strikes me as... Um, is quite a um, quite a jump from a, a nice warm sunny country to um, I'm freezing up to here. Glasgow. I mean, how did that come about? Well, I was working as a concert promoter previously, so I was ten years working with. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know Live Nation. Um, so the promoter I was working with, although an independent promoter, uh, was very closely linked to Live Nation, uh, and my experience had been operations of a, a major. Um, concert promoter and dealing with everything from U2, 360, Lincoln Park, Chili Peppers, mostly stadium shows. And one day I got a call out of the blue saying that there's a, a company in Glasgow looking for somebody and my name came up through references and I thought there is no way I would move to Glasgow. I mean, I mean, why would you when you're living in Cape Town and surfing every day and working at concerts at night? And Anyway, they convinced me to get on a plane and uh, I came up and when I w walked into Tom's building for the first time, um, I knew immediately that it, I should forget about the warmth and everything else back home and there's a really real big opportunity here. So, yeah, within a couple of weeks I ended up, in fact it was just over a year ago, that walked into uh, the Hydro, which was still in its final phases of construction. Um, you'll remember um, in was it June last year that we had a, a major fire in the building before it was completed. Yeah, um, I was going to come to that, but I mean, like now you mention it, you know, everyone in those sorts of crisis situations has knows where they were. I mean, wh where were you when you heard the news that the the venue you were going to be running had, had just caught fire? 
I was on a red bus tour around Edinburgh, funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what happened? I mean, did you just get a text and, uh, or was yeah, I got a call from our marketing manager saying, listen, we've got a bit of a PR problem, a bit of a media problem. Um, are you watching STV? I said, no, I'm on a red bus tour around Edinburgh, just gone past the castle. He said, whatever you do, get back to Glasgow because the building's on fire. I was like, no, you're fucking kidding me. There's no way that the building's on fire. Uh, so I wasn't in town. Um, our chief construction pilot over here also wasn't in town. Is that right, Tom? I got a call. That's not a PR problem, by the way. That's a fire problem. <laughs> like, that is to PR. You know, like, if you've got the right person, you can message anything away. No, I was in London uh, and, like, with friends, and I got a call from the finance director. And he was stood in the building in his shorts. He'd come straight from a barbecue. And, like, <laughs> ironically... He stood in his, his like fluorescent shorts watching the thing burning down. And this is June, this is early June, and we're opening at the back end of September. And he said, Tom, I don't want to worry you, but um, the building's on fire. And I said, well, <laughs> don't call me with stuff like that. And I put the phone down on him and then called the foreman. And, you know, then you start working through it. So we had a, this is what you get with, um, with such a big, ambitious project, is you get this stuff, you get firms going bust, you get artists wanting, you know, knocking on John's door and wanting to play the building six months before you're even thinking about opening it. And at that point in time, everyone individually, you know, and, and within the, all the different companies that are involved uh, in, in, in delivering it, they all had the choice about how to respond. You know, do we, do we just accept that it's late? And then, you know, we have to deal with everything that comes from that. Or do we pull together um, and find a way of getting it over the line and open on time? And luckily, we, we um, and huge credit to the contractors and all those guys involved. Um, we, we, let me just talk you through the opening because this gives you a flavour of how nuts this stuff is uh, delivering a venue. Um, on the 23rd of September, we got um, the guy from the council came down and signed off that he was happy with it. So an hour later, we signed off the building contract. Then at lunchtime, we got our public entertainment license um, and our alcohol license. The day afterwards, our staff came in, lots of, lots of whom were in there for the first time to receive a quick induction. The day after that, we had a stakeholder event with 3,000 people coming in for a little gig um, and using the, you know, the toilets, the food and beverage, all of that for the very first time. And then pretty quickly, um, by, the, by that weekend, Rod Stewart's team were loading in. They did the sound check. They did the rig, the, sorry, rigged sound check. Um, they, were at, they, they were done by 1 p.m. that afternoon. So they, were, they had a half day off, at which point we we're all still flying around, painting things and checking handles on doors and all of that good stuff. And then on the, on the Monday night... Uh, Rod started his first of four performances, and we we did about we did about eight days solid, I think, John, that opening opening period. So that's uh, there's a lot of people who haven't had time to take a breath for for a year. But all now. I can say is a shame that you weren't running the trams in Edinburgh. They <laughs> might have got it sorted out, or actually the Parliament before that. Um, so, John, what was your what was your main priority? Do you have a list of tasks that you really had to sort out when you? when you arrived in Glasgow? I mean, the, the main task really was to just set up some kind of strategy to ensure that there is ongoing content coming through the building. To be fair, that did get put in the parking bay a little bit with some of the construction issues towards the end of the project. Um, you know, as you correctly said, it's one of the few buildings in the UK that has actually come in on budget and reasonably on time. Um, we had a lot of tricky dancing to do with the promoters for the first two weeks. Uh, we were continually keeping them updated. Um, it, you know, Fire, for instance, I remember going straight back into Glasgow and I had to phone 10 promoters personally on that Saturday afternoon and tell them that, look, there is a chance that your artist may not be playing in the building. We will do everything we can to make sure that Rod Stewart is there for <laughs> opening night, but it's quite a difficult conversation to have on a Saturday afternoon to say, listen, I'm sorry, but Rod Stewart may not come in the building. And the first response is, it's going to cost you fucking five million pounds. <laughs> in which case, you're like, well, Rob, we'll, we'll do everything we can to get the building open. Just trust us. And it's like, well, I don't fucking trust you. And it's like, you know, you've... So that's r really what we were dealing with for the first six months. 
Um, did he say anything afterwards once you had delivered it? And no, it I never heard from him for months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even after, and to his credit though, you know, when Rod Stewart did make it through on that first night, Rob was one of the few people to, to come up to us and say, look, I didn't really believe you were going to do it, but, you know, it's an impressive building. You've delivered it on time. You know, and, and that was so important for us because so much of this industry is about relationships. Um, and it, it was key for me in p particular to know that we really had no choice but to deliver the building on time if we were going to have a continued, comfortable and healthy working relationship with promoters. If we'd started on the back foot and been six weeks late, every conversation with the promoter from now until eternity, we would have been reminded about the day that we never made the building um, we never opened the building on time and we never met with our commitments and that really would have put us in a really difficult position. So you've, you've made a, a big success of it already. I mean, we're talking 600,000 people. Um, what is, what's the long term um, with the hydro? Are you, are you, um, have you got any ideas? Are there any things that you've, you hope to have in place in two years or, or five years? Obviously, the MTV Awards are coming up um, in the autumn, and there's the Commonwealth Games. But are there any things that you've not managed to do yet that, that are on your on your to-do list, so to speak? You know, if, if we look at the current success and the long-term success going forward, um, a large part of that is you know the old adage of "build it and they will come." Um, you know, before Tom and my time the team that considered building the arena put a lot of thought into it and a lot of its success is inherent in where it is. Um, you know, outside of Liverpool, Manchester, Sheffield, north of that, there is no arena that has a catchment area at all. I mean, we're the only arena in, in the area. And so uh, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the business we get, we get purely because of the building and where it is. Uh, it's just that, that additional 10% that for us is the real sales challenge. So we're really trying to create uh, content going forward that is unusual and typically wouldn't come into the building. So MTV Music Awards, which we've got coming in November this year, is one of those examples where we've had to go, go to Viacom and MTV, work with the city of Glasgow, who we've got a really good relationship with, in creating additional content. Um, we're looking at creating some festivals, uh, things like Hogmanay, which of course Edinburgh is known for. We're looking to do some a different take on Hogmanay, so really creating events that ordinarily a, a promoter wouldn't do in the normal course of business. So that for us is really where our marginal profitability is going to be. And one of the things that has always interested me is that with a venue like that and bringing in all these people, they're not all going to be from the central belt. I mean, is there something uh, where you're going to start targeting people from outside Scotland and really integrating it into Glasgow's tourism structure? Yes, I mean, some of it's natural. So we had Top Gear Live recently. Um, the TV show came and did five performances um, at the Hydro. How does that work? What's, it, what's it's a phenomenal show. I mean, it's just cars and the three boys. It, it amazes me that it works as well as it does. But well, so they just have these cars on the stage. Yeah, and they do. They talk about the cars. They do a couple of tricks. They do car football. You know the usual things that you would do on TV. They they ad adapt for inside the arena. I mean, we sold five performances of that. So we're t talking close on forty thousand people that came through to that. But there were no other performances anywhere else in the UK. So we we had a large number of people driving up from down south. Um, and our long-term aspirations, and you would see it with some events like the MTV Music Awards, for instance, we would certainly get uh, fans coming through from outside of, um, you know, the main island, as I call it. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll get a lot of people coming across from Northern Ireland and Ireland, and even as far as Scandinavia, it's a real big catchment area for us. So some shows where a show is maybe touring the UK, for instance, and, and not going across to Scandinavia in the short term, we foresee that as a nice catchment area for us too. So will you start to, to do marketing in these countries as well, like Scandinavia? I mean, we've got a lot of Germans here um, this year. I mean, is that something where you, you see yourself maybe partnering um, with different tourism organizations to, to sell concerts in, in Glasgow? Uh, yeah, or our, events for that? Our matter? marketing is interesting because a lot of the marketing for the content that comes into the arena is marketed by the promoter. So it's driven mainly by the promoter, but we do work very closely with uh, GCMB, which is Glasgow City Marketing Bureau. 
Uh, Tom touched on it earlier that one of the key important things for the city about the hydro is the economic impact that it has on the area around uh, the building, Glasgow, and then the broader Scottish economy. Uh, and so we work very closely with whether it's Visit Scotland um, or GCMB to do that additional kind of marketing. Are you seeing any evidence of that? I mean, when you, you go to your office now, do you go past loads of new places that weren't there before? It's, it's phenomenal. Finiston in particular, which is the area just the other side of, of the railway line, is, is booming at the moment. I mean, the nightclubs and restaurants are, I mean, it, it's a changed city. Um, I lived in Finiston when we first moved to Glasgow um, a year ago, and in six months it is com it's a completely different part of the city than it was. Are there any things that are particularly good that have opened up where you're like, yes? Um. <laughs> Tom walks home that way every day, so he can tell you every pub on yeah, the way home. Yeah, it's all good. Um, <laughs> and it started improving the second John left it as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we've, uh, we've got a couple of minutes for some questions, so does anyone want to be the first person to ask a question from the audience? Can you put your hand up? Uh, can you bring um, this chap here a microphone? Oh, you've got a microphone, Mikey. I didn't see that. Hello. Hello. Oh, got a signal. Hey. Hello. Hello. Um, when you spoke about making the actual venue as dark as possible, um, how did you manage to get away with that without breaching health and safety? That's it. Well, what you've got is you've obviously got a set of house lights and then nested within the house lights, you've got lights that are specifically designated a bit like some of well some some of these lights here are doing that job um to make sure that the aisles and vomitaries are properly lit so there's like a, a low it's like between two and five looks on, on, on each tread and what we did we luckily we've got an armad, armadillo to practice on so we got a load of fittings and they're actually they're they're, they're from the the showbiz fittings they're not um, the kind of things you get in other non-entertainment buildings, um, and they've got your, your barn doors on to keep the 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 the, the beams fo tightly focused, so there's not spill into the audience. Um, so there's that, and obviously you've got your running men, um, which uh, what's a running man? That bloke there who's running. Oh right, yeah. okay, yeah. So yeah, there's 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 a bit of code around that, but it's also just some sensible design. So there's a a, a, a level uh, at which people feel comfortable. Right. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have a question? Oh, there's a chap at the back there. Hi. Um, does it baffle you when places like the Picture House in Edinburgh close and your venue's doing so well? Um, as a broader industry, we're very worried about the closure of smaller venues and iconic venues. And I was recently, I think, Olaf, you might even have been there at the International Live Music Conference in March this year. There was the, the bigger players in the industry, whether it's the production teams, the venues, we all recognize how important it is for smaller venues and grassroots venues to be creating an industry for the bigger venues and stadiums and the bigger promoters to, to benefit from. Um, and it's really worrying for us and as an industry, we're really worried that right across the UK, a lot of the iconic live music venues are being uh, closed for whatever reason. Uh, and there's a real big movement underway uh, and a charitable, charitable drive underway to protect those venues and, and because we recognize that without those venues, a venue like ourselves will, will never exist. We've got, actually got that, that's the next talk, is about how, by the Music Venue Trust, so it's quite a topical question, but we stick around for that, um, that's on immediately after this, but that actually brings me on a question that I wanted to ask, because obviously, if you can, um, you've got your Timberlakes, your, your Gagas, these big acts that have really um, emerged quite a few years ago. Are you planning to initiate anything that will help emerging talent in, in Scotland that's on your doorstep? Well, I think even these kind of conversations and forums are really important for us. We certainly do not want to be seen as a venue that just operates at the top end of, of the value chain. 
Um, it, and, you know, as I said to you earlier, it's so critical for us looking down the line that we're able to create content and support content that eight, nine years down the line are still coming through the hydro, whether it's heritage bands or new bands that are being created. So, as and it's not something that we do in isolation. It's something as a broader industry that we need to continually keep talking about. The, the hydro performs a really important role in, in Glasgow and broader Scotland. There was never previously an arena that was able to uh, provide a home for the kind of content that we're seeing currently. And I'm, I personally am so glad that we now have that opportunity that we're able to, to raise the profile of, of music and live music through just the fact that that kind of content and that massive n amount of content is, is, is coming through Scotland. Um, but we cannot forget that it, it needs to germinate somewhere. So when I send you the, the list of Wide Days bands this year, you can, you can twist someone's arm and put them on as a support. Or I mean, I know you got Admiral Fallow, for example, um, doing the press launch. So, I mean, is that something that we you know, we can see more of if you are doing any things uh, along those lines. Yeah, for certain, you know, I mentioned earlier about the festival idea. It's something that we're working very closely with uh, Glasgow City on, is developing various, genre, whether it's genre-based or whatever the, the concept is of the festival, that we drive things right across the city so that it's not just the hydro. So we've got Glasgow Comedy Festival, for instance. Um, we're working on a, a country festival. Funny enough, we're looking at an electronic dance festival. So the hydro is purely just one aspect of that. But where we're using the armadillo, we're using the halls in the SECC, and that we're using the clubs um, and other live music venues within Glasgow. So um, it, it's not just the hydro, but the right. hydro is one part of a, a bigger picture of live music or comedy for that matter. Okay, so um, anyone else got uh, one last question? We can squeeze in. Okay, uh, right at the back. Uh, could you just explain the name of the venue? The Where name of the venue? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, Tom mentioned earlier that we've got some commercial partners. Um, the naming rights, the main sponsor of the building is um, SSE, which is Scottish and Southern Energy. There was obviously a natural link between that and hydro. Where it used to be called Scottish Hydro. Um, it's on the water, it's on the banks of the Clyde, so there's a link to the hydro there. The, there's a link to hydroelectric power. Um, so the, I call it the, the pet name. Everybody refers to it as the hydro, but the full name is the SSE Hydro. Okay. Do you, do you know that the, a lot of the Victorian hotels with swimming pools in Scotland were called hydros? So. That's, you know, it was generally a kind of sign of a posh hotel with a... We're Victorian not getting pool. people turn up with the towels, if that were you mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll be wearing my Speedos at the next gig I come to. Okay, so... Um, Happy thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I'd um, like, to, uh, like to ask you to give a big round of applause to Tom and John Thank from you. the Hydro.